It's April 11th, 1803. You're part of a delegation led by Robert R. Livingston, who has been granted approval from President Thomas Jefferson to offer $10 million to the French government to purchase the city of New Orleans. Astonishingly, in response, Napoleon offers the entire Louisiana territory for just $5 million more. But amidst the excitement, as the young country literally doubles in size overnight, there remains a serious problem that Jefferson and the other founding fathers feared. The very survival of the nation rests on access into the interior of the continent. With the high cost of transporting goods, settlers could simply turn to the British, French, or Spanish, develop stronger economic ties, and the frontier will be lost forever. The expansion of the country could easily be halted, relegated to a relatively narrow slice of land next to the Atlantic. But at this same time to the north, a small group of merchants, entrepreneurs, and politicians look to capitalize on a topographically advantageous break in the mountains through the Mohawk Valley. A risky new vision emerges in the construction of a canal over an astonishing 363 miles, a feat never before imagined. Few in the New World have ever seen a canal, much less built one of such magnitude. It will require new technologies, massive funding, and a workforce far beyond current supply. No wonder when the proposal reaches Jefferson, he responds that it is little short of madness. This is the backdrop for the amazing story of the Erie Canal. And over 200 years later, as Carl and I meet in Buffalo to begin our journey, we can't help but feel the drama all around us. This ride will take us through one of the most important events in U.S. history, a drama born of great courage and responsibility, tossed about by political infighting and naked ambition, fed by the blood, sweat, and tears of the common man, the eagerness and bravery of adventurous immigrants and of innovative technology no less awe-inspiring than that of today, making the seemingly impossible possible. That excitement courses through us as we make our way on the first steps of a seven-day, 363-mile journey that will take us across this great state It's 45 degrees out right now. What happened? you doing? This feels great. <laughs> All right, look, you're gonna get a double dose of history today. So first history lesson is the great explorer, Henry Hudson, from where the Hudson River derives its name. He was searching for the Northwest Passage, this fabled waterway that was somehow going to connect east with west, and it, you know, didn't exist. Anyway, he went up what is now called the Hudson River, and uh, some, for some reason, he did not really even notice the Mohawk River, which, you know, would have taken him pretty far west. He didn't notice it. He went further up the Hudson, he got discouraged, turned around, went home. <laughs> so, he didn't see it. He didn't see the potential. That was long, long before 
the history of the Erie Canal. But there's your first dose of history. Carl, how you feeling? Great. This place is called Water Vuliet. You may not be able to tell, but it's like low 70s. It cannot be more gorgeous today. All right, to, uh, to continue our history lesson, you know, to understand history at this time, you gotta, you gotta understand what the 1800, let's say year 1800. The year 1800, I think the U.S. population was a just, just almost six million. I'm gonna flash the correct number because I'm gonna screw up a lot of these statistics. It was about six million. Ninety percent of residents were farmers. Ninety percent. So I read a statistic that just a handful of of cities had a population greater than 5,000 people. I don't know why, I wanna say 10. 10 cities at that time. So I live in a little town, about 12,000 residents. And to think that that would have been a large place in the year 1800. So, hence the need to have some way to connect farmers and to unite people. New York City was not a big city. In fact, if you read the contribution of the canal, there's many people that believe that it was the canal that turned New York into the city that it is today, in terms of population. So, you know, we go through these little towns and you realize they sprang up when the canal sprang up. And otherwise, a lot of farmers and a lot of farms. That's the, that's the land we're riding through right now. be the Erie Canal Trail we didn't get lost several times per day we've been lost twice <laughs> it's gonna be interesting to look at these signs and see how I screwed this one up here's a really bad example of a sign Carl point it out <laughs> both are going there we went the wrong way anyway all right bump that's a heck of a bump Deep hill ahead. Yeah, it's working. 
I ran over. I ran over you. Just recently? I mean, just, I mean, just, just now. Yeah. Drama. I just ran over my camera. All right, back to history. Ready for some history? You're ready for history. I know it. I can tell. I thought what I would do is talk about one prominent figure per day. Ooh, just ran into a bunch of gnats. Um, there's no better character to start with than the father of the canal himself, Mr. DeWitt Clinton. I looked up online how many cities, counties, towns, villages, municipalities are named after Clinton. That should tell you something. I mean, you know, think about how many towns are named after Jefferson, Washington, Adams, Lincoln. Lots of places named after the man. He was an incredibly popular guy and a very respected, revered gentleman. He was accused by his political adversaries of being an aristocrat. He was wealthy and he came from, well, he was very connected. His uncle was the governor of New York. So anyway, he served in a lot of different capacities. He was a state senator. He was a senator in DC. He was a lieutenant governor. He was a governor. I think he was even the mayor of New York City for a while, but the thing about DeWitt Clinton was his just single-minded devotion to what he knew the canal would do. Uh, not just for the state of New York, but for the country. And he never lost faith in that. He was deeply committed to making it happen and through thick and thin and all sorts of adversarial relationships, he kept going and he overcame incredible uh, odds and, you know, made it work. And um, incredible guy. His adversaries called the canal DeWitt's Ditch, or I think they called it Clinton's Folly. They mocked him, they made fun of him, they said this was silly. Thomas Jefferson called it nothing short of uh, what do you say? Nothing short of insane or nothing short of lunacy. Um, and when he approached the government for funding, they said no. And uh, he had to, you know, combination of taxes and backers and all sorts of stuff. Really gave his life to see this happen. And how did his political connections pay off? They kicked him off the Erie Canal Commission. I think it was a year before they finished construction. Thank you, DeWitt. Well, it backfired because the public was so outraged. He won a landslide election as governor and then he got to oversee the whole opening of the canal as the governor and take a major victory lap. So here's to you, DeWitt. You should be a household name for what you did. There you go, there's the history today. Patersonville or Patterson? <laughs> I think it's 
Might just be Patterson. We got six more miles. I think we're gonna make it before sundown. So, <laughs> night descends. We got a late start, obviously because of the train. And uh, well, it's getting to be fall, so the nights are coming sooner. Just hoping we make it by nightfall. And we got lost for, I'm gonna say two miles today. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> that sign, those arrows, I think somebody, we're thinking somebody took the sign off and turned it upside down or something, because that just makes no sense. No sense. <laughs> I'll get over it at some point. We only got about another four miles. Is that right? Maybe three miles. But the sun has gone behind the mountains. And it's starting to get cool. I'm not complaining about that. Today's weather, oh my gosh, today's weather was fantastic. I think the hottest it got was low 70s maybe. So nice. The sun has gone down. The castle. <laughs> now I'm gonna make it up this hill. <laughs> oh! I made it. this morning. It is gorgeous. So Carl and I are just out looking for breakfast and rather than go to Dunkin Donut. Dunkin Donuts. I always say Dunkin Donut. We're going to we're going to the Stars Cafe. That looks like the kind of place that two bike packers would go to. <laughs> Oh, good night at the castle. Good night, sleep. Okay, as we begin our epic journey today, Carl, what did you do to make this a more enjoyable trip? I got rid of about 25 pounds worth of clothing in my bag that I didn't need and had them shipped back to Cincinnati from the hotel <laughs> because I realized I had too much and I don't have enough training time under my belt to have an enjoyable trip. But you gutted it out yesterday. I did. Absolutely got it out. Like I, I made it. Like the cycle of beast that you are.
interesting. This is to get your bike touring license. Oh, termites, jeez. <laughs> I don't know what those cones were meant to signify. <laughs> the village of Kanajahari. Wow, we're making good time today. So, Cannon Johari is the home of Beach Nut. Tuck that one away. down in Texas somewhere. No? Okay. John Kitna. We got this on camera. Yes, John Kitna. <laughs> I'll flash his face up so people have some contact. John Kitna is coaching the Suns team at the Dakota West. Ryan, is this What's arrow up? correct up here? I'm not losing two miles again today. <laughs> You're My not blood cannot handle it, Brian. But stop, stop, stop. No, stop. <laughs> Seriously, is this arrow correct? I mean, I, is it correct to even hey, have two arrows? Carl, there's two arrows. I think. No. I think it's right this time, dude. The, look, look. I think the trail goes straight. <laughs> Come it's on. It's a double right, dude. I am not putting more mileage on today. <laughs> Carl's butt is having a problem. <laughs> that's a lot of seaweed. I get you don't want that in your pocket. That's a that's a nightmare. Man. Oh, I'm just coming through. I don't know. Beautiful boat. There you go. You're on your way. <laughs> oh, he was down there. Somewhere. Have a good day. Enjoy. We finally made it to some gravel. <laughs> nice. We've been on pavement the entire time. 50, no, 85 miles of pavement. Happy times. It's time for our history lesson today. So the person we're like going to discuss today, it's actually people, are two famous people who, well, let's just say they were indifferent to the construction of the canal. They were both Virginians. They were both presidents. 
They both believed that if there was going to be a passage to the west, it should go through Virginia. Why? Well, I don't know. They both owned a lot of land in Virginia, and let's just say they might have benefited from such a venture. But they were not thrilled. Apparently in the 1800s, there was a lot of animosity between certain states, and Virginia and New Yorkers didn't get along. I don't know why. I'm not going to get in the middle of that one. But it definitely played a part. It's crazy to think that during the Jefferson administration, ah, that's the other person. I asked to boil it. To begin the Jefferson administration, the U.S. had a surplus. And they were looking for capital improvement projects for the country. And when the Erie Canal Commission, or at least early people came to see if the federal government would support it, they said no. Jefferson said no. I think I already said it yesterday. He said it was nothing short of lunacy, insanity. <laughs> so, they didn't support it. Washington had his own company called the Potomac Company that he tried to do modifications to the Potomac. And of course he made it to Cumberland, but then you got to get up over the mountains to Cumberland, over to Cumberland to get to the interior. So that wasn't going to work. And his company ultimately failed. And I think he almost went personally bankrupt through that venture. It was a failure. Good for him. Later, he knew how important it would be to have a a way to the interior that he actually traveled to up to the Erie Canal to see what it looked like. He was well advanced in years, so he no longer had the, let's say, strength and energy to push it, but he encouraged them. He thought it was, when he saw it firsthand, he understood. Washington was a surveyor also, so I think he sort of saw the physical opportunities like other people maybe didn't. Okay, Jefferson, final postscript is he wouldn't entertain it. But years later when it was a massive success, I gotta take my hat off to Jefferson because in his memoirs, he basically said, I really blew that one in so many words. Uh, he recognized that it was an error in his judgment. So let's hear it for politicians that recognize errors in their judgment. <laughs> <laughs> they used to exist. <laughs> Alright, there's the history lesson. Historic. Oh, are we in Herkimer? No, Herkimer is 2.1 miles away. That is where we're stopping for the day. What a great ride today. Such beautiful weather. We were hoping for some fall weather. Fall weather, uh, changing leaves, I should say. We don't have any changing leaves, but this is some of the most beautiful fall weather ever. Just upper 60s.
it's really about this time on the trail when you start to see a lot more of the canal um, you know a lot of the canal has been filled in and paved over and <laughs> unfortunately but uh, you know we're about what 120 miles in this is when you really start to see it and the further we get west you see a lot more of it so um, yeah nice nice change of scenery Just in case you don't know what you're doing. Oh, you go, you go. Yeah, gravel. Woo! Listen to that. You know, I woke up this morning and realized if you're new to this channel, and if you are welcome, glad to have you. <laughs> uh, I failed to mention that I, I rode this last year. I went from west to east instead of east to west. And, uh, wait, did my head do that right? East to west, not west to east. Um, and I love this trail. I absolutely love it. That's why I'm back. This time, though, I'm with my buddy Carl, which is different. But this is a great trail. So I did this last year. So I was thinking about, last night, what's different this year. And I'm going to say one of the big differences is I've noticed a lot more signage so far which is awesome because quite frankly last year there was some serious frustration and as I say that here I am no sign and I don't know where I'm if I'm going the right direction <laughs> it was much improved I'm gonna assume this is the trail and I'm gonna wait for my buddy Anyway, thank you, New York State, whoever that manages this. Good job. More signage, clearer, newer signs too, so they're not faded and you can't see where you're going. There it is. It's grown over, but that's it. Running dog. Oh man, I don't know. We in, we might be near Rome. Yeah, we're in Rome. This is Rome. So all those express went in Rome. This is it. Everything you've ever heard. You got to do it while you're here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I amuse myself so easily. <laughs>
All right, look, I don't want to complain. I'm not going to complain here, but I talk about signage. Here's a perfect example. So you come to a fork. Nicole loves Dave. What's that? Nicole loves Dave. Yeah, Nicole loves Dave. Nicole loves Dave. You can go right or left. Well, it almost feels like you want to go right, but no, you don't want to go right because if you look at Nicole loves Dave, look behind Nicole loves Dave. Hopefully you can see it's left. That's so faded. That's so faded you have no, no way. I'm sorry, I don't mean to complain. This is a beautiful trip. Now, Rome must be a lot bigger than I realize. So a little extra history today. When they started building the canal, they built it in sections and they didn't start at the end points. They started right here. Here's the sign. They started right here in Rome and worked their way back to Utica because they wanted to prove it could be done and they wanted people to feel like this was a good thing to do. So they built some miles in. Lock 21. Wow. Isn't this beautiful? Yeah, Go right over. All right, today's history lesson. I gotta come with a little animation for that. A little animation and some music. I'm gonna put in right now. Okay, today's history lesson is about a, I'm gonna call this guy the poster child for why the canal needed to be built. He was, uh, his name was Jesse Holly. H-A-W. L-E-Y. There's another guy, H-O-L-L-E-Y. We'll talk about him later. Anyway, Jesse Holly was a, uh, a huge advocate for most of his life. He was a flour miller, if I have that title correct. He manufactured flour. And he was frustrated by how long it took and how expensive it was to get his flour to market. So. He invested as a businessman in a couple different ventures and well, they didn't work. And he went into debt. And of course, back in the late 1800s, he went to debtor's prison for 20 months. And what did he do? Did he cry in his milk? Nope. He wrote a series of essays while in debtor's prison about the need for a canal and how important it was and how, you know, and what they had tried to do and failed to do. And so his writings inspired DeWitt Clinton to take it seriously. In DeWitt Clinton's memoirs, he says it. These papers were really influential in making him aware of this need. Well, it was built, and wouldn't you know, DeWitt Clinton went out of his way to make sure that among the dignitaries 
that would be on the dais in Rochester when all the celebrations were going on in 19, or 1825 for the canal. Guess who one of the MVPs, the dignitaries, the people being honored was none other than Jesse Holly. Isn't that nice? Nice bow on the end of his life for his contribution and inspiration to make it happen. Jesse Holly, today we dedicate this ride. Carl's back there, he's gonna agree with me. We're gonna dedicate today's ride to Jesse Holly. Dunkin' Donuts right next to the Days Inn. We see we got a little got a little drizzle going this morning it's a cool morning it's in the 50s but uh, nothing horrible still a really nice day Chittanongo the birthplace of Frank Baum everybody know who Frank Baum is sure you do sure you do Look on your bookshelf, you know who it is. Morning! Morning! How you doing, morning? Nice. Morning! changing leaves just a little bit all right better late than never we're finishing this up but there's an area here called historic Erie Canal State Park it's 36 miles long and as you can see it's been paved and gravel but really well done, that's really nice. It's in between Syracuse and, I'm not sure where it started yesterday. 
I'll look it up and flash it on the screen now. just suddenly hit like a big time headwind. Anyway, this um, we're riding on top of the Erie Canal. This is Erie Boulevard. And uh, I don't know when it was, 1900s, they paved over the canal and this is it, we're riding on it. We're lost. <laughs> We're really lost. <laughs> Signage outside of Syracuse is not good. It's just not good. I mean, <laughs> we're really lost. Trail. All right, there we go. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where we went wrong. All right, I keep waiting for the wind to die down to do our history lesson today. Our history lesson is about a gentleman named Governor Morris. It's not his title, that's his name, Governor. And uh, you know, spelling, I don't know, if I was his English teacher, might take some points off. Actually, I think he was Dutch. And you know the Dutch. <laughs> I have lots of Dutch friends. How y'all doing? Middleburg, Netherlands. I miss you guys. Anyway, Governor Morris was a founding father. He signed the Articles of Confederation. He signed the Constitution. He actually wrote the preamble to the Constitution. So for those of you who remember, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, go ahead, sing along if you remember uh, Schoolhouse Rock. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union. Anyway, he, um, he was a big advocate for the canal. Well, not really for the canal. Uh, that's why I'm, okay. Why am I bringing him, him up today? Sorry, busy intersection. All right, there we go. I bring him up today because he was in the late 1700s. He was really, uh, they, you know, people weren't, they weren't thinking about canals because they didn't have canals. So he thought that you could just improve the Mohawk. And, you know, you would improve the Mohawk and like if, you know, if it like wind it around on itself like a snake, you would just cut across, which is sort of like a canal, you know? Anyway, uh, the reason I'm talking about him today is about 30, 35 miles up that way, north of the section we just went through, is um, Oneida Lake. And that is where the Mohawk starts. What do you call that? Headwaters? 
the headwaters of the Mohawk. So Governor Morris was one of those people that believed improve the Mohawk River to Oneida Lake. Then there's another little small river. I think it's called the Oswego River. It'll get you up to Lake Ontario. And then Lake Ontario over to Lake Erie and you know. Now of course there are a lot of issues. Like how do you get around Niagara Falls? And uh, the weather on the lakes was very extreme. So, well, he came around and uh, he was served on the first Erie Canal Commission and uh, was one of the people to, you know, continue to push this forward even late in his years. So, tribute to people who learned to change their mind, who are willing to say that something's not going to work, but let's try something else. Governor Morris, our figure of the day. So we just passed a sign. This is the halfway point of the old canal. It's a town called Memphis that was called Canton before. And uh, it was the halfway stop between Albany and Buffalo. Lock 50, well, where the heck was the canal? Well, probably on this road right here. Oh, it's over on that side? No, no, no. I'm saying that the canal is probably right here. All right, here's the lock house. Isn't that interesting? Serve lock 51. It was moved here. <laughs> All right, scat, scratch that. There's some old lock walls. Another aqueduct.
Good morning, Carl. <laughs> Good morning. I thought maybe we'd go ahead and do our history lesson now, rather than end of day. All right, today's figure is a gentleman named Myron Holly. H-O-L-L-E-Y. Myron Holly. He was credited as being the uh, the financial project accountant. Well, I guess one of them, but one of the main ones for the Erie Canal project. And for those of you that ever worked with really good finance people, Eric, if you're watching this, tip of the cap at you, buddy. Um, you know, what do really good finance people do? Well, they make sure that you don't run out of money and you make sure that you know you stay on target and well Myron Holly was one of those guys the thing you got to realize is that I mentioned this before when DeWitt Clinton and the Commission went to the federal government to ask for funding Jefferson said no Wow, I'm really kind of going fast here hopefully you can hear me they said no so, they had to fund this through, well, I think three predominant ways. One was through taxes. Another was through backers, investors. And then finally, they had to have that really delicate balance of tolls. So, and why I say balance is obvious with tolls, you can't just... Look, if people can't get their goods to market and then all you replace all those logistics costs with tolls, that doesn't do a whole lot. So, well, this guy was kind of a financial wizard because the canal obviously was super popular and people used it. And uh, by the way, the cost, I understood that the cost, the logistics cost, okay, moving products fell by... 94 percent so all you logistics managers out there imagine you're spending a hundred bucks on logistics and canal opens up and with tolls and everything else you're now paying six dollars anybody like that equation i think they do well that's what myron holly was able to do and in addition the canal was paid off in four years. Four years. Opened in 1825. It was paid off in 1829. That's pretty amazing. So today's history lesson. Tip of the cap to you, Myron Holly. You are the man today. Well, you know. You know what I'm saying. Congrats. Thank you, sir.
of the fun parts of this ride. Well, it's true of a lot of rides, but when you pass somebody on the road, I just passed a guy, I don't know if you can see him back there, I don't know. Uh, you know, you only get a second when you're riding by, but I'll be like, hey, you going to Buffalo? Yeah, I'm going to Albany. <laughs> Little second interaction that just cheers you up. We stayed in a room next to a couple last night who are uh, who are going the opposite direction and we could have sat there and talked with them for hours it's kind of funny how that happens is you know you want to help them out so you want to tell them all the little tips and tricks to get around places and <laughs> I mentioned last year in my video a guy named Tony gave me the guidebook and I was so appreciative. He was so kind and he was worried, you know, that I wasn't gonna be able to make it. And he was right, I needed that book. And I said, hey man, I'll mail it back to you. And he said, no, give it to somebody. So last year, I actually, when I got back to Albany, I went in the Amtrak station looking for a cyclist that I could give it to and there, were, there was nobody there. So we gave it to that couple this morning. So Tony, if you ever watch this, your book has gone on to someone else. We passed it on. <laughs> and I said to him, please pass it on to somebody else. So <laughs> your kind gesture has been paid forward, my friend. Thank you. Look at those beautiful John Deere's. Have a good ride! Where are you, Trail? There you are. Yeah!
Okay, trail closed, really? All right, we came back and looked at the sign here. This is not good. This is a pretty significant detour. All right, we're gonna be good boys and follow the detour. Don't want to, but we're going to. Yeah. I don't blame you. He just saw a sign for another detour. As my buddy Carl likes to say, it's the detours in life that add to its richness and meaning. He didn't say that. What's been kind of rumbling around in my head today is a sign we saw in Lyons. The original Erie Canal, the standard for the, say the 1917 edition. It was built to be 40 feet wide, four feet deep. And that lasted for about 20 years. And then they did a, an expansion which is what we see a lot on the old Erie Canal now, which was 70 feet wide, seven feet deep. And that lasted almost another 80 years. <laughs> that's amazing to me. I mean, that's a lifetime. So, you know, the Erie Canal as a commercial waterway was almost a hundred years. Like I said, it officially well, as a, again, as a full waterway closed in 1917. And there were two things. It gave way to the Erie Barge Canal, which we've actually already seen a good bit of that. That's still working. And then, of course, the railroads. And the railroads are what basically took over. Think about that, 100 years. Trying to think of things that have lasted a hundred years, you know, <laughs> big building projects that are still around. Oh, I guess there's quite a few, but anyway, yeah, hundred years and 70 by seven seemed to be that seemed to be the glass slipper, so to speak. What a strange metaphor. This is a cool town. 
Oh, if I could have found a place to stay here, I would have. The Canal Lamp Inn. Good morning. Just leaving Pittsburgh for day six. And I gotta tell you, we happened on a total find. You know, I just use that uh, bikeeriecanal.com uh, website to find places to stay, and I was not expecting what we found <laughs> for last night. That was absolutely beautiful. Morning. Uh, that had to be one of the most quaint, beautiful old houses. That's a B and B. Okay. <laughs> there are Airbnbs that are hidden myths. That is a place that is cared for and uh, tenderly offered out to uh, people who stay there. That's beautiful. Wow. Um, couldn't recommend that more. That's five stars. Can Canal Lamp in. Put the link right below. If you're ever looking for a place in Pittsburgh, highly recommend it. Morning. Henrietta. So give credit where credit's due. I was just telling Carl, my impression of Rochester as we're exiting the western side is far, far different than last year. 
and uh, well, somebody's been out here cleaning this trail because <laughs> it's well done. How you doing? Good, how are you guys? Good. All right, frequently asked question for today. I get this one a lot. You may have seen the video I did on how to, tips on riding the Erie Canal Trail. I don't remember the name of it. I don't remember the name of it at all. Anyway, uh, I should probably do a follow-on video and add this to it. Part two. Um, so I get this question a lot. People say, hey, good for you. You got seven days to go ride the canal. I don't have seven days. I got one day or two days or three days. So where should I go? And in my humble opinion, I think the most beautiful part of the canal is the western side between, I'm gonna say Tonawanda and Greece. It's like this. Small towns and, uh, you know, gravel, limestone, trail. If I were really pressed, say you only had a day. I would start in Lockport and I would do an out and back headed east. Lockport to me is the single most interesting point on the canal. It's just my opinion. I think it's amazing. There's, it's an engineering marvel. We're actually going to talk about that later. And then I would head east and go out and back. That is the single most beautiful spot on the canal. That's my opinion. Buyer beware. We're gonna stop and get some lunch.
probably can't see it yet. There's a sign up there, and I'm willing to bet that is the sign for the northernmost point on the Erie Canal. If it's not, I owe Carl a couple rounds tonight. Now I'm an idiot because I didn't bet him what I got if I'm right. And I'm right. <laughs> Boom. All right, Eagle Harbor, that says. All right, today's history lesson. It's not really about a specific person, per se. It's people. And specifically, Carl and I have been talking about this for the last half hour, almost. It's about the many immigrants that came to this country seeking a new life there was a big influx in the 1810s to 1820 time frame predominantly Irish but quite a few German as well and they found work in this massive project and as we've been riding along looking at this canal and just thinking of the back-breaking work of digging this and oh by the way they didn't have you know steam shovels and Kubotas and John Deere's and trucks and tractors and all kinds of stuff this is pickaxes and shovels and black powder makes you pause makes you thankful Hey, here's to you, immigrants who came here and made this country. Well, places like this, such a great place. Carl and I just stopped. Maybe you have a question. Where's that guy going? Where'd that guy come from? Where'd that guy go? Well, Carl and I were just marveling, right, Carl? Yes. We were just marveling about the Medina culvert, which is a, runs underneath the Erie Canal. So there's the Erie Canal. Look over there. There that, there that guy went. See? See him? He went under this thing. And we think that's amazing. Technological advantage. Engineering in 1823. In 1823. The other great thing about the Medina culvert is it's near Medina, which is where we are ending today. <laughs> Almost there. Morning, Carl. Good
Morning. Day. Last history lesson. Today's historical figures, there's two people. A gentleman named Benjamin Wright and another gentleman named Canvas White. Canvas, yes, with two S's nonetheless. Oop, you alright? <laughs> he did that on purpose. All right, to understand these two guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you take two. <laughs> you, you have to understand that at this time in history, engineering was not really a discipline. Class is in session. Let's behave before you get a detention. Engineering was not the discipline it is today. So a lot of the technology on the canal, as I said yesterday, was shovels and pickaxes and toothpicks. toothpicks. Exactly. So they had to rely on a lot of creativity and ingenuity and on the spot improvisation. So I was reading that they invented a patent for a new kind of wheelbarrow. That was one. Another one was a, a uh, tree stump remover. Never done before. Hey, here's another one of these canal boats. Morning! Sorry, I just screamed in the microphone. But we're coming up on one of the biggest engineering marvels of the entire canal, and that's in Lockport. They had, I believe it's 70 feet, a 70 foot granite wall to get up and over. And I should point out that when they started construction, they didn't know what they were gonna do. They didn't know how they were gonna get over this. They just started and they were relying on people to come up with solutions. So you're gonna see what this is, but it's a staircase of lock of locks. I believe there's five that ascend up the side of this one after another. Absolutely ingenious. Indescribable. Indescribable. What was the Princess Bride word? is inconceivable that little guy inconceivable I know. little squirrely guy yeah. inconceivable people watching this video are screaming it out right now and we don't know anyway that's today's historical figures those two gentlemen engineers and all the other people that brought about their creative problem solving on the fly amazing stuff Okay, again, imagine you're digging along with shovels and pickaxes, <laughs> and then this comes into view.
Sorry, we're gonna stop and spend some time here. So again, your boat, you come into these locks and there's five of them. And of course, right next to that is the uh, newer canal. Look, if you come through Lockport, do your buddy Brian a favor. I'm your buddy, I'm your buddy Brian. Stop and take that in. Schedule some extra time. Read all the signboards. <laughs> Look at everything, take that in. That is, as I was standing there, I saw a biker go flying down. He had paneers on his bike, just flew down the hill, didn't stop. <laughs> I don't know, maybe he'd been there a hundred times already, but um, that's amazing. That's incredible history right there. I should have attached this onto yesterday's frequently asked question, but people ask a lot about the surface on this trail. And if you don't want to ride on, you know, gravel or crushed limestone, you like paved surfaces, then start on the endpoints. You know, Albany to Schenectady is almost, well, I think it is 100% paved and beyond. I don't remember where it stops. But, you know, from Lockport, pretty much clear on down to Buffalo, you're going to be on paved trail and you can do you know that's some pretty good mileage between those so anyway a little bit to consider Mississippi Muds having some lunch. And Brian, what did you have for lunch? I did a what did I have? 
seafood sandwich. sandwich. Right. How was it? It was fantastic. This is right off the trail, and it's an excellent stop to see the Niagara River <clears throat> and other bodies of water merge right off the trail. Enjoy. I don't know about you, but at the end of each long ride, a countdown begins. Sometimes it's the last mile, sometimes the last five to ten, but today it started about 15 miles out. It's this quiet time when I start to reflect on what we saw, what we experienced, what we learned, all with the desire to capture it and somehow bring it back. There's just so many questions running through my head, and if you've made it to the end of this adventure, maybe you could also ponder the voices echoing across this 200-year-old canal. What are the granite cliffs in our lives we need to face head on? What are the creative skills and abilities we have to learn to get up and over those barriers? What beliefs do we need to reconsider and possibly even change to be better people? What single-minded passion is calling us to dedicate ourselves? And what are the words we need to communicate to inspire others? This canal is just beyond words. I loved it last year and this new experience enjoyed along with a good friend it made me love it all the more. And despite all the other trails yet to be ridden, I know I'll be back because, well, it's just that sort of place. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you out on the trail sometime soon. Milepost zero. Because there is the canal. <laughs>